You know what we could all use a little bit more of? A little bit more grace. And that's what this message really centers around. James has been telling us how we can do better and we ought to be better. But then there's a little oasis, I say, where he gives us more grace. Listen and see if you don't find some grace for your life. God bless you, and I hope to see you here at First Presbyterian Church. We've been talking through James and looking at all the things that he wants to make sure this scattered church understands and the ways they need to relate to one another. And James has been pretty tough on him. There's some things that need to get worked out. And he is not done being tough on them or on us. And he has something to say today. We're looking at James chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Pray with me, would you? God, it's your word. It's your truth preserved over millennia. And now, bake it fresh and put it in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I bet you know this little poem. You know it well. It's the poem about the girl with the curl in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was... And when she was bad, she was horrid. I assume that applies, that we know that can apply to little girls. We also know that can apply to little boys. Well, if James were here today, he might say, you know what else it applies to? Churches. The church can be this place of love and support that we all long for it to be. Just as we've heard, facing a surgery and and maybe you're not sure how this is going to go, and you, you call up the church, and you speak to Belinda's warm, accepting voice, and say, could I just get my, my surgery on the prayer chain? And you know there are 100 people praying for you. It doesn't take all the fear away, but it does a little something. Your, your child is, is talking to you as you're driving along, and your child... You feel like your child's always talking to you, but this time there's something that's kind of coming through and making sense. And what is it? It's, it's something that they learned in King's Kid. It's something they learned in Sunday school, something they picked up. And you give this little silent, thank you, God, that, that that church did that. And you guys have a great conversation and you know something important has happened and the Lord has done something for you. Maybe... Maybe you sing in the car, and that's about it all week. No one is asking you to get up there at a karaoke night. But when you come here, you start singing the songs, and something gets to you. And when that song turns a corner, when we're talking about the, the, the music touching our soul, we get it, and, and you almost get choked up. Sometimes you do. And you, you experience the closeness of God. And there are times when I am preaching and you think that I must have been spying on your life this week because what I'm talking about is just what you're going through. But just, I'll just let you know, I have not been. Uh, I generally don't do that unless I'm paid, then of course. I, but, um, but, but what you know is that the Lord must have given me this message to speak in some way to you and somehow in the 
alchemy of all of it, God is getting a message to you. That's what the church can be. It can be all of that and more. But the church can also be, well, horrid. And apparently that is just what is happening to the scattered church that James is writing to. And he wants to bring out the root cause of their disaffection with one another. Now, he has just warned us about our motivation. He says he doesn't want us to be driven by selfish ambition or bitter envy. Now he wants to continue making sure that our hearts are right. He says, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And here, what James is doing is really taking a page out of Jesus' book. Because Jesus reframes those Ten Commandments from those ten specific things that you cannot do to say, you know, the heart that's behind these things is still doing all of that. So we read, for example, in Matthew, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister ooh, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which is, means kind of spit, like you're just not worth spit, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Anyone get off the hook from that one? Anyone? I doubt that there was a lot of murdering going on among the brothers and sisters in the early church to whom James is writing. But there were words said that slayed reputations, that killed off friendships, and that ended relationships. And what did they covet? In the Ten Commandments, you're not supposed to covet your neighbor's things or your neighbor's spouse. But in this case, they, there is a coveting of leadership. It is a desire to have their side's teaching be held higher than the others. The reason he said we ought to act out of humility rather than selfish ambition or bitter envy is because that was what was motivating them. And that is when churches turn horrid. I recently learned something that maybe you already knew. The, the Salem witch trials had their basis in a number of factors that sociologists have looked at. And there were rivalries between families, between regions. But one of the factors was that two of the girls that were originally, these girls originally started writhing in pain and saying they were tortured, two of those girls were the daughters of a former pastor to the church. And those who were killed were predominantly people who supported the other pastor who was now head of the church. So this argument about who is in charge literally had turned them into killers. Talk about, and when she was bad, she was horrid. I mean, that is rough stuff, don't you think? Now, of course, it's easy to point fingers at the church. But as soon as you do that, Three point right back at you. In this contentious age, and nobody can, can argue against that, in this contentious age, tell, it, tell me it isn't easy to make someone with a different opinion out to become your enemy. And James says, your focus is always on yourself. When you are praying, your prayer is to get more money to spend on your pleasure. It is too often about you and about how you can schmooze the right people to get ahead. And our guy James, he's not a modernist. He never sees gray. He sees stark choices for us. Either we are on God's side or we're on the world side. And if we are playing both sides, well, that's what adultery is in his book. And so he lays it on them. You adulterous people. <sighs> Heavy, don't you think? And adultery is, is a central metaphor in the Old Testament. In fact, the prophet Hosea had what has to be described as the most unusual call to ministry 
I've ever heard. His call was this, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. That would be an interesting way to look for a spouse. I need, need a good promiscuous woman for this. He marries a woman named Gomer. If you're considering names for a little girl, I suggest you steer clear of Gomer. And the metaphor does not end there. He has two children, and they are, in the Hebrew language, they are named. The first one is named Not Loved, and the second one is named Not My People. And you might think God is uncaring, that he's glad to leave his adulterous people to their own disaster they're going to make, but that is not how God feels at, about it. At one point, he just cries out, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? He tells Hosea to reconcile. The Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again, although she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cake. That was a symbol of the pagan festivities. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. Now, I don't know all the ins and outs who did he pay these 15 shekels to? Or is he paying her for her time? But even in the tangle of their relationship, even in the pain of betrayal and the heartache that comes from the twists that happen between couples when they get into these incredible messes, recriminations, arguments, even in that mess, God wants us back. It's an illustration of the Lord's desire to not give us up. James knows the heart of this God who will not give up on us. And almost like he's a friend to someone who else who has been treated so poorly, as if he feels the pain of God, he speaks up for the Lord. If your life is all about this world, then you are an enemy of God. God, he says, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell within us. The meaning is God wants to be with us. God wants to be connected to our hearts, to touch that spirit within us that he placed there. And then after all this criticism we receive in James, and he has been pretty tough on us these weeks of summer, after all of this there is a little oasis. There's a little De there's a little uh, green spot in the desert sitting all alone is this tiny verse but he gives us more grace and I want to concentrate on that on that gift of grace for the rest of my message because we all need to be reminded that he gives us more grace maybe you're a person who has turned your back on God for a time you knew that he loved you, but you were interested in trying some other thing that, that appeared more exciting. You were fascinated by the attention you received from certain people, and you wanted to explore that more. A decade later, you woke up and found that your spiritual life was a wreck, and your personal life was a mess as well. You didn't know how to go forward. You didn't know how to go back. But there was this Christian friend who just happened to give you a call. And you who bore the name, not my people, because you'd walked away from God. You had a sense of how much that you wanted to be God's again. All these years later, here you are. You discovered that he gave you more grace. And how about Hosea's other child? Young, not loved. That was your name, wasn't it? You'll never figure out exactly what was going on with your dad. But you worked awfully hard to find a love that was never quite given. And attention that 
that never came, a word of praise. And the years since, you realize that probably he bore the same name. But you were seven when he was naming you not loved time and time again. You were 11 and he didn't show up. You were 14 when he said that terrible thing to you about what you were going to amount to. Somewhere, it got mixed up with God. And the person you met and married knew God differently. She knew Jesus as someone who loved her tenderly, or he knew that Christ was not just on the cross, but alive today. And slowly you've been untangling these two, your dad and God. And today you mostly understand that your name is one who is loved. He gave you more grace. We often talk about the victim in a church in a difficult relationship. But that wasn't you. You were the one everyone points to, the wrongdoer. Once you failed, you just kept on failing until you were known as that criminal, as that moral loser, as that unqualified person. But somehow you realized that you were bought, not with 15 shekels, but the blood of Christ. That name you went by, it is time to forgive yourself. You are not Gomer. You are God's own. You have received more grace. And finally, there is you. You, the once fiery prophet, the person who said whatever they wanted to say because it was the truth. But lately, you don't say so much. You have become bitter at the poor turns your life has taken. You believe you deserve better. I just want to say that you have done good things and God is not punishing you. You have a way back to the Lord. Drop the bitterness. Realize that today and even now, you have received more grace. Don spoke about communion. As we come to communion today, as we drink from the cup and break the bread, I would add my comments. I would say, try to think of Jesus himself serving you. Try to imagine him looking you into your eyes and saying, I did all of this for you. And perhaps you can also imagine James coming up after him and saying, so don't turn away. Don't fall into someone else's arms. But here's the grace. If you do, the sacrifice of Jesus is that precious reminder that the door is not closed, that there is a way back no matter what your name is, that he still longs to know you and to touch your heart. It's not over. He gives more grace. Let us pray. Lord, as we speak of these terrible names, this name of not loved or not my people, or Gomer the adulteress, or Hosea the broken man, God, we know those are sometimes our names. And so we just ask that the grace you have promised us, we believe in. Allow it to be true in our hearts. And as we give of our resources, let these resources be used to spread that grace, to spread that love, to spread that hope into the hearts of many. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we have been reminded. And so we will remember all that you've done for us and that you called us by name by our rightful name and teach us the real truth that we are yours remind us again now and throughout the week and for all of our days we pray this in Jesus name Amen now that you've had communion go out in this world knowing that you are loved knowing that you are his people In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.